once you know you start seeing these you know Virgin uh, Virgin Galactic or X Core vehicles going to space with you know more or less normal people, you know the, the paradigms change in people's minds. There's, there's a paradigm that got really frozen into place after the Apollo was that space is just hyper expensive. It's totally impractical. I can never see myself on the top of a Saturn rocket going to the moon. And so the, a lot of people just they just sort of lost interest after Apollo, and that's that, because they had this very frozen paradigm in their heads of how space is done. And that's gradually the past few years. I'm going to talk about this on the panel tomorrow, but th this thing is starting to melt finally. That space can cost don't necessarily have to be hyper expensive. I mean, they're still expensive, but they can can come down. It's not there's no physical or engineering laws that says. It has to be impossibly expensive to go to space. And yet, paradoxically, those lunar landings, the, the, the manned missions to the moon, is what put the bug in a lot of the people that are driving new space today. Right, yeah, I mean, a lot of us, you know, but like, like Henry always says when, why he started this conference, is that he thought by now we would be flying, right? <laughs> you know, they, they were turned on in the 60s. You know, I remember going to Cape, Kennedy in 61, my cousin got a job there, just out of the Navy, and he was giving us a tour, and, you know, and it, it just seemed like, the, you know, sure, at the beginning it would be really expensive, but, you know, they would eventually have fully reusable vehicles and so forth, but it's like I said, it just got kind of fixed, you know, the big uh, satellite companies and the military and so forth were satisfied with these very expensive expendables, they didn't need anything cheaper, really, to do the limited things they needed to do. Unfortunately, NASA got stuck with this very expensive shuttle and just decided not to try to start a really systematic program to, to go for lower cost. And so it got kind of frozen for like 30 or 40 years there. And finally, it's in the past 10 years, things are really starting to change. Tell us about what you've seen, where it's been, where it is now, where you think it's going. In the 15 years that you've been, 15 plus years that you've been covering this sector now. Yeah, it's been, it had a lot of ups and downs. If you remember in the, in the 90s, there was a lot of excitement that uh, there were gonna be these big constellations of satellites. There was a teledesic, was a, gonna be 900 satellites uh, to pro provide band, uh, broadband internet around the world. Uh, Bill Gates invested in it and so forth. There was going to be Iridium and, and uh, some other these constellations. And the idea was, oh, this is going to be a great market for launching those satellites and they'll, they'll need replacing. And so all these companies, little companies started popping up like uh, Kistler and Rocketplane because they were going to do the replacement market. And, but then things sort of went downhill. Teledesic, you know, the, it took a long time to develop. And in the meantime, there was uh, the sort of competition, you know, ground systems got faster. And also, you know, Radium and Global Star, they, they, they went for the cell phone or satellite type of uh, handheld phones. And they took so long to develop that the cell phone business sort of wiped them out. And if you remember, they went bankrupt and then they, they went through chapter 11. Now they're, they're sort of still in business, but they're a fraction of the size of what they were. So anyway, it's, and Teledesic got, Cancer, especially after the, the recession of 2000. So that, around 2000, you know, there had been all this excitement. Like I remember like Gary Hudson giving these talks around 98 about the rotary rocket, and it seemed like, you know, maybe in a few years, we'd have a single stage rocket travel uh, to orbit. And then there's, you know, the, the bottom sort of fell out. Around, by 2001, it looked like, you know, he, I remember him giving a talk, he says, nothing's gonna happen for 10 years <laughs> in this field. But, in the main, but at, at that same time, though, the x core people, the Armadillo, a few years later, Blue Origin, and then you know, SpaceX started to come. And so things have gradually gotten back to where it seems much more robust, much more real now than it ever did in the 90s, as far as real vehicles flying. And uh, you know, we've had 10, no, no, we've had like seven tourists go to space after Tito, hunting Tito. And, uh, the, and you've got a Robert Bigelow. I've been to Robert Bigelow's uh, facility in uh, Las Vegas where he's building these uh, space stations. I mean, it's a very serious, well-funded effort. And, it, you know, the, the, the big 
problem has always been uh, capital, that most of these companies couldn't get enough money. But now there really is serious money available. There's like a billion and a half has been invested in uh, sort of new space companies now in the past couple of years. So it's, it, this is the first time it's really seemed real. I mean, like in the, you know, in the 80s, they talked about space industrialization and so forth, but none of that really seemed real. But now there's, uh, there's real money, there's, real, there's rockets flying, like as we see with SpaceX. And uh, you know, it's, it could be an exciting few years. I mean, the, the world's been a little bit disappointed that you know, we thought after Spaceship One, within two or three years, there'd be several suborbital vehicles flying. But you had, you know, Virgin, uh, Virgin had their problems with the propulsion, and the others had problems with funding and so forth. But it's getting really close now. So it should be a, I think this year and next year, there's going to be a lot of interesting YouTube videos of stuff flying. <laughs> okay, so, so in five years, you've got SpaceX flying people, and you've got, and they're flying people to Bigelow space stations. You've got, you know, you've got tourists going, you've got, sub you've got reusable suborbitals flying, uh, Spaceport America and so forth, you know. That, that's that's not, not fantasy. That's actually looks like it's going to be true in five, six years, maybe a little bit longer, plus or minus a year or two. You know, then the question is, what how, what happens after that? You know, what what about space colonies? If you think you want to have huge space colonies with 10,000 people by 2040 or something, you know, what? How do you get from there to there? And I think it's really interesting is to think about what are the, what are the incremental steps get to really serious uh, space settlement, which is kind of the ultimate public participation in space, right? 